So I gave a sermon, uh, how long ago? I wrote it down, I'm not sure. It's about two and a half years ago. I think it was in 2016, called Quit Yourselves Like Men. Uh, it's, I had wrote the number, number 948. It was meant to talk about God's design of men. You know, God designed us. He designed men. Uh, he actually has made us in his image, and we should reflect that. And so there's aspects of being a man that reflect that. Um, I want to talk about the other side of that today, and I want to explain how to be a woman. And I hope that sounds odd, right? Because uh, I, it's not like I have a lot of personal experience uh, in, in doing so. I'm not one of those, anyone who's seeing a sermon for the first time with the Living Church of God. Uh, I have known many. I have a mother, and I have a sister, and I'm married to a woman. We couldn't make any. All we have are boys, so maybe there is a defect there somehow. Maybe I may not be qualified. Now, I do know that something I find fascinating is that some of the most... Uh, clear and helpful and uh, just explicit advice about being married in the Bible comes from the Apostle Paul, who wasn't himself at the writing of those things uh, married, because those things aren't grounded in terms of necessarily personal experience, though they certainly can be helped, but they're grounded in, in truths. As long as we're focused on truths, uh, we're safe. Let me just say, I hope we are, uh, because I plan on grounding these things in, in truths. I had given this as a singles and young marriage Bible study at the uh, Living Education Men's Dorm, and I got positive feedback. A lot of the, the young ladies said, oh, I, this is really worthwhile. You ought to consider giving this as a sermon. So I'd like to blame them if it's a terrible idea, but I just talked about being a man and being a gentleman, and that also seems like a really, it doesn't seem like that's really a, a doesn't really tie. I combined the topics about how to be a man and how to be a woman and the, the corresponding to God's design in my teen seminar uh, during, the, uh, during the Charlotte Family Weekend. And it really condensed it down and, you know, made it something concentrated, and I couldn't believe it all fit somehow. And I do notice, I know how it all fit because I ended up cutting a lot of corners. Later on, my son told me, one of my sons, I won't say which one, I don't want to embarrass him, but it was, his name rhymes with Schmenjamin, right? And he said, uh, hey, Dad, uh, you know, you misspelled one of your slides. You misspelled a word. I'm like, really? Oh, I hate when that happens. Which one was it? It was the one about men. You talk about how men, you know, they, they, they want to be competent. You misspelled the word competent. <laughs> I thought... That's the worst word, I think, to misspell, let alone I'm a professional editor. So also, that comes across absolutely terrible. So why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you raise your hand and let me know? Because why well, didn't want to be that guy in the audience that raises his hand and tells the guy he misspelled a word on his slide? So it's like, well, thanks. But anyway, uh, so if you're out there, if you're a teen who ever sees this, I, I found out. So yeah, anyway, I was able to get all that in. And we don't often talk about the... Uh, the female side of that equation, often we're speakers and we're men, and so we, we're more familiar with that. And the fact is God designed both of us, right? He designed man and woman to reflect him. And frankly, those things are under attack today. And when you really do look at it, I hope that I'll be able to include at least one example of, a, of a, an article and a news item that illustrates it's not just a confusion, it's, it's an attack it is an actual attack trying to convince men and trying to convince women that the ways in which they uniquely represent their creator in their design and makeup is somehow an unclean thing. And that you should rid your personality and your approach to life and how you see things of those things and discard them like garbage because somehow it's, it's wrong. Somehow it's wrong for a man to want to embody certain masculine things and a woman to want to embody certain feminine traits. Uh, it really is remarkable the zeal and the passion that's gone into this to the point that we're taught we should view gender as some kind of spectrum. Like somehow even the words male and female lack meaning other than being extreme endpoints on some plot some line that somehow we all really appear in a variety of different places. And it's funny how it goes against the grain of almost everything else the world claims to believe in. It goes against the grain of science. 
You know, in biology, they don't study gender-neutral raccoons a great deal, right? Uh, and they don't say, well, we know that amongst the uh, raccoon species, there's no real male or female, you know, it's really just some kind of odd spectrum. Uh, you know, they're always saying we should follow where the science goes. Science doesn't say any of this stuff. Uh, that they're trying to press on our men and on our women. Logic certainly uh, doesn't work. Common sense definitely doesn't. They actually press these agendas against science, against logic, against common sense. But frankly, that's just a byproduct. That's the means to the end. The end is to press it against God. Because the world, excuse me, the world out there generally doesn't like how God has designed men and how God has designed women. And if you're going to actually follow the fact, if you're going to take in as a fact of life that God has made us in his image, then you're not free to recraft yourself in whatever image you want to be. The devil can't change a world to match his image when it's populated by people who recognize I am made in the image of God and not you and not the fancies of my imagination. It is a world that is aggressively pressing to convince us to abandon our design. And so this might just seem like, well, this is a nice thing to talk about, but believe it or not, the very core of civilization itself is rotting because of the opposite of the sentiment we're going to talk about, which is embracing that you're actually designed by God for a purpose. So the title of the sermon today is Woman by Design. Woman by Design. And we want to talk about the fact that if you're a woman, you were designed to be so. And God did that for purpose and for cause. And I want to acknowledge a few things, and I always have to do that with a, a bit of a caveat. There's some really great books out there that I have been exposed to and seen. Uh, some we've even used, I think, in uh, some Charlotte Family Weekend seminars in the past. Uh, there's a fellow, I want to get his name right, um, Emerson Egerix. I think it's called Love and Respect. Can I get a head nod from someone? Love and Respect. It's a, it's a book about men and women. Uh, also, there's a couple of books by the Eldridges. I think it's John and Stacey Eldridge, Wild at Heart, about, you know, being a man and I can't remember, I think Captivating is the name of the one for women. It's, it's difficult when it comes to books in the world because the only book you can ever completely endorse 100% and not worry about it is this one, right? Uh, and some of those books, you know, I've, I've read them. I read them in the past, and there's some helpful elements, but there's also some just inaccurate elements. Uh, it's just part of, a, you know, part of the challenge in being a wise Christian consumer. Uh, but I do have to say, some of those ideas I actually hadn't thought about until I, I, I noticed them and I was able to discuss, discuss it with other ministers and such, some of the things I saw in those, but there's also things in there that, frankly, I, I don't agree with. They're completely, uh, completely wrong. And he has some ideas that are actually so good. And it takes someone willing to swim against the stream to say things like, uh, men want respect. And that just as a man, should, a man should love his wife unconditionally, a woman should respect her husband unconditionally. It's not the kind of thing you see people in the world wanting to say. And so I appreciate in, in their positions, these kind of authors, that they at least recognize that fact, even if they are still stumbling around in the dark concerning some other things. Also, I need to warn you, I will be speaking very stereotypically. Um, please forgive me ahead of time if that's, that's going to bother you. I want to recognize the things I'm going to say. I don't mean to speak stereotypically in an inappropriate way. And let me give you an example. Um, in my house, uh, we do have a uh, table saw. We have a lathe. We've got a lot of great tools for woodworking, and they're all my wife's. Because I, the only thing I think I could achieve with a table saw is chopping off my own finger sometimes. I think I probably could. That's pretty easy, I've heard. I've heard it's really not very hard. No, I, you know, I, I, I could do that. I just wasn't brought up to do that. That's, that's not me. I'm more the bookworm. I've had to, to grow in some of those sorts of things. At the same time, uh, who's probably in our house the biggest fan of musicals? Uh, probably me. You know, I really like a good musical. I, the light turned on when I was a kid. I used to think they were dumb. Nobody in real life walks around singing. Nobody. That doesn't make any sense at all. And of all things, it was My Fair Lady with Rex Harrison, right? And so I thought, okay, this is all right. You know, anyway, so I've, I've been in musicals when I was in college and enjoy, I don't sing very well, but still somehow I was stuck in musicals. And, uh, and I really enjoy that. So when I talk about, I'm speaking stereotypically, we're talking about trends. We're talking about collections of things. 
because going back to my wife uh, and myself, overall, there wouldn't be any confusion in our house. If there is a bug, it's very clear whose job it is to kill the bug, right? Uh, that would be me. When I hear the shriek, I recognize that's the bug shriek. You know, it's time to, you know, it's time to go take care of business. Uh, so we do vary in different ways. If I were to say something like, and I won't say it as one of the points in this sermon, oh, women and their shoes. Boy, don't they love shoes. And you're a woman who thinks, I don't like shoes. I don't, I don't appreciate that stereotype, uh, Mr. Smith. But you have to agree. There's some here who go like, yeah, I got to admit, I really like a good shoe. You know, really, it's important to match those shoes with that outfit. That's a really good deal. I like the fact that I just focus on brown and black, and I'm good. That's really it. And some would tell me I don't actually get that right very often. Mr. Weston will challenge my brown shoe choice sometimes. Uh, so anyway, that's about it. So keep in mind, I, I am going to speak in such a way because we are talking about trends. You're going to say you're generalizing. And I'm going to say, yes, I am. That's what generalizing means. It means it's not true in every detail about every person. It means that there really is something in general that's true here. Uh, it actually relates to a scientific study. I should have looked it up before I came, and I, I wish I had because some of the quotes are, are, are really very telling. And it was a scientific study talking about, they examined brains, and it was I wouldn't say the height of it because I think we're still in the transgender confusion. It's still going on. But it was at the time when it was really picking up steam and there was some sort of study that declared there is no woman brain and man brain. There is no female brain or male brain. Now, they were doing it, you could tell, as I'll mention in a moment, in service of this sort of gender neutral idea, which is kind of funny because that's how many people justify feeling they're the other sex is by saying, I'm a, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. What does that, that mean other than, other than when it comes to the mind and, and the brain? But regardless, that's what they were saying. Oh, no, there's no such thing. Men and women are just the same. And the titles that you would see on the newspaper articles that were really, that were publishing this and publicizing it would say, oh, no difference, male and female brain. It's like, well, okay. But too often, people don't actually look at the studies. They don't actually go back uh, and actually read the studies. And when you read the study, because what they did was they had brains that, uh, from donors, people that I hope are dead, if they're donating their brains, but uh, you know, it could be some in the entertainment industry still living, I have no idea, but regardless, people who donated their brains, and so they had them anonymized, so they didn't know. Uh, it, one wasn't labeled Bob Smith, and you assume that that is a, that that is a male brain, or, or Sally Smith, and you assume that's a female. So they were anonymized, so they could examine them. But they did say, they said, now, anytime we had a brain, we knew immediately, we could tell whether it was a male brain or a female brain. I think, wait, whoa, whoa, hey, whoa, whoa, what did the headline say, right? What did the headline say that, oh, there's no, there's no intrinsic differences between male brains and female brains, and yet when they had the brain, they said, okay, we knew this was a male brain, we could tell this is a male brain or a female brain. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? Well, the headlines, all the more when it comes to studies, more than anything, the headlines as they're reported are generally what's serving the purpose. And it was how you choose to characterize it. So let me, for example, let me say this. Uh, given, say, woodworking in our garage, my wife's, uh, let's say fondness for musicals, you know, me. What they were essentially saying is, look, you know, there are structures that I'm going to, this is not exactly what they say. I hope you understand I'm just trying to characterize it in a way uh, that helps communicate the, the idea. You know, is there a structure that means you're, you're predisposed to wanting to work with wood and the rest all the time that's unique, that, that you see that structure and go, oh, yeah, that, that's a man's brain? Or is there a structure that says, wow, whoever had this brain sure likes musicals, and it's always women, you know, and that's always what it is. No, there wasn't something magical like that. But on the whole, you could always tell. On the whole, you could tell for various reasons. So yes, we differ in some wonderfully detailed ways, but there are very fundamental things that truly are found generally in the population for males and females. And again, for males, I, I covered those in the Quit Yourselves Like Men, at least some of them. This won't be an exhaustive list, to be sure, but we did cover um, some of those. And let me also say, since we're going to be talking about the design of women, let me highlight that that doesn't mean the men are off the hook uh, for this, right? It's like, oh, good, I am so glad you're going to straighten out my woman, uh, Mr. Smith. That sounds fantastic. Uh, let's turn to 1 Peter and chapter 3, just to make sure we understand the context. 
First Peter chapter three. I get my eyeballs on. First Peter chapter three. And verse seven. We read here a command to husbands. Husbands likewise, 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands likewise dwell with them, that is your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. We have an obligation to understand each other in the world. Our job isn't to somehow make our wife change in every way she needs to, uh, to match me, we also seek to change her. We seek to grow and be one together, right? We're trying to become one flesh. And we're commanded by God to dwell with them with understanding. That means understanding how they tick. That means understanding what's important to them, what they're passionate about, what's challenging for them, what's a burden for them. Every man who's married has been challenged to earn a PhD in his wife and to make that his lifelong pursuit. And so we don't get to get off the hook and go, oh, yeah, I hope the ladies straighten themselves out, you know. Just like with the other sermon, I hope the ladies didn't think that 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 one meant, oh, yeah, good, I need to straighten out my husband. That sounds great. Here's the way I like to think about that. Ultimately, the things we're going to talk about, and it's true for men as well, the things we're going to talk about, some of the the natural design-based desires of women, fundamentally, in the end, Only God can ultimately fulfill them. Only God fundamentally can cause a man or a woman to truly feel fulfilled in their purpose and design in a way that is complete. And any attempt to pursue that where he is not the main ingredient will always fall short. There is nothing a wife can do, try as hard as she might, to help her husband feel the full expression of being a man unless God is somehow a part of that. There's this hole in us. He's designed us to need that part of the ingredient. And it's the same with ladies. Uh, it's the same on that side of, the, of the, the difference between the genders. All these things, these desires, only truly, fundamentally, can God help you comprehend and experience that fulfillment in these things. However, that said, as the other sex, if you will, as the husband of a wife who longs to feel fulfilled as a woman and and, and truly completing her design as a woman, or as a woman who is married to a man who longs to actually feel like a man, that he actually matches God's own plan for him as a man and design, we can either help God in his efforts or we can hinder God in his efforts. And today, if we're talking about the design of woman, that's why we as men still have to pay attention to this. This It's why I had to pay attention to this. Because I don't want God trying to say, fulfill my wife or a a granddaughter or, you know, just another young woman in the church or another not as young woman in the church. Any, Any female who exists in my sphere of influence, I don't want God working for them on their behalf and having to swim upstream against the direction of the flow I've created. I want to be a part of that. I want to contribute to that. And so it's really on all of us to understand each other and how God has designed us. So as we launch into that, let me uh, point out a foundational idea that's really at the the heart of a lot of this. And it was one Mr. I've I've referred to it before. It's one Mr. Wakefield referred to in his article, God is Creating a Family. It's the March-April 2004 issue of Tomorrow's World. And he used a word, I bring it up every once in a while, I loved it. It's called theomorphic was the word that we don't anthropomorphize God like people often accuse us of in the church. We're not forcing on God some sort of idea of man. Uh, And so when we call God a family, it's because we're somehow anthropomorphizing him. We're We're just saying God is a family when really he's not. It's the other way around. We're not anthropomorphizing God. God has created a theomorphic universe. This universe was created and designed to reflect him by him. So it's the other way around. We're not taking a human idea of a family and pressing it on God. Rather, God has created the family to reflect what he is doing in the world. 
And it's important to get that distinction around because the very ground of these things we're going to talk about is that these characteristics are a part of a woman's design in which she reflects her creator in a unique way. Not because we're pressing ideas on God, but because he designed the world this way. So with that in mind, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. When it comes to some fundamental things, Genesis is almost always sort of a go-to chapter. Genesis chapter 1. By the way, if uh, the National Organization of Women has any special forces or a secret prison somewhere, it was, it was good to know all of you, and I hope, uh, you know, hope you have a good life and, and things go well. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Genesis 1 and verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, I did hear a guy once, I haven't heard it a lot, but I did hear him express the idea that, well, that means only man, that is, males were created in God's image, and that somehow females weren't created in God's image. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. Uh, I did hear it once, and I actually disproved that in an article in Living Church News I wrote a few years ago called In the Image of God, that that's just nonsense. It doesn't, one, it doesn't make logical sense, because uh, when, when I heard from the fellow, I said, well, well, then what image is woman made in? Oh, well, she's made in man's image. Uh, all right, uh, transitive property, right? So if man is in God's image and woman is in man's image, guess what? Woman is in, woman's in God's image. That doesn't, even, that doesn't pass logic, actually. But it also doesn't pass the Bible. Um, it's interesting. The word where it says God created man, this word for man you see used frequently in these passages is Adama. Uh, not like Battlestar Galactica, uh, but actually the Hebrew word, Adama. And it's, it's not just the word Adam. Adam is definitely intimately related with that. But it's also a generic word for mankind. In fact, there are uh, verses, there's one in particular in Numbers, where the word is used and it refers only to a gathering of women. It's only a collection of women. Uh, in fact, it calls them maidens who had not intimately known a man and refers to them as Adama. It's, it's humanity. And in particular, we could go to uh, Genesis chapter 5. And when it says God made Adama and made him in his image... We can see it here in Genesis chapter 5. And starting in verse 1, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the uh, likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them Adama. Called them, Adam and Eve, Adama in the day they were created. So when God is using that word that he made, Adama, he made us in his image, yes, both man and woman are made in God's image. I, I think the fellow who brought it up was well-meaning. I think he noticed, well, men and women clearly are shaped somewhat differently, and vive la différence, right? I mean, I don't need to go into any kind of detail about that, but at the same time, even if you, like my eyesight is, is not the best, it's like it used to be. I had to get my Walmart cheaters up here again. Not a plug for Walmart, by the way, but still I had to get my, my cheaters. Um, but, you know, say you know, your eyesight is blurry, right? It's really getting worse, and you see a figure, and you can tell it's a man or a woman. You know it's a human being. You know it's not your cat. Is that fluffy? Oh, no, who are you, right? You may not know, you know, if it's a man or a woman, but you get that, you know, you, the, the shape. We're all designed in that shape. What kind are we clearly? Man and woman are of the God kind. So I only mention that just in case there's any kind of confusion. Uh, we are, humanity is made in the image of God. But it actually goes beyond just shape. It's not just shape. Uh, think of how many ways in which we reflect our creator. If you look at verse 28, oh, sorry, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. We read, then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the air, over the birds, sorry, the fish of the air, what kind of fish are those? Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
Uh, we read like in chapter 2 that they were given the Garden of Eden and to tend and keep the garden. In so many ways, those things reflect our Creator, right? Uh, in fact, what is God doing? What is part of his, his huge, amazing purpose with all of us is to reproduce Himself. And He essentially tells man and woman here, you need to be fruitful and multiply, you know, fill the earth and subdue it. This is your stewardship and responsibility. Like God has responsibility over the creation. We have responsibility over the earth. Like God has dominion over us, these lesser life forms, as not to mention the angels and such. We have dominion over a world of lesser life forms. Being a human being is an opportunity to practice being God. Yes, one of the things that's fun about Minecraft, the video game, is you get to build all these things. You get to play God. But you know what? IRL, in real life, you get to play God. That is what you're doing. When you leave your room a mess and just let it go and, you know, live your life and oh, the, there's pizza upside down on the floor and the, you know, the bed goes unmade for days. You go to wash the sheets and decide it's too much to put them back on the bed so you just lay on the mattress and, and all the rest. You Well, you're playing God. You're just doing a bad job, right? Uh, you're, doing the kind of, you're doing the God that creates Tohu and Bohu and actually doesn't make things, make things better. He created us to reflect him. We're moral beings with moral accountability. Uh, I've mentioned before, when a, when a lion kills a zebra, it's not a murderer. It's just hungry. But if you kill your neighbor, Mr. Ceiling Wall, that's murder, doesn't make a difference if you are hungry. That's murder. We reflect our creator in ways that no other aspect of the creation does because we are made in his image. And so then it, it comes to that. Well, if men and women are different, and yet we both reflect our creator, then is it much of a step to think that we reflect our creator in different ways? That we reflect our, our creator in, in, with different focuses, if you will, different aspects uh, of who he is in some of these differences. Again, when the world is trying to convince you to abandon the differences between the sexes, that is the devil wanting you to abandon the ways in which God has designed you to reflect him in a way the other sex just doesn't. In a way the other sex just doesn't. It is a privilege to get to reflect your creator. And it's something we shouldn't be so willing to let go of. All right, so what are some of those ways? Let's kind of jump into them. What are some of the ways? It's definitely not an exhaustive list. And any ladies who want to debate them with me later, please feel free. I'll be hiding uh, in the car in the parking lot. No, I'm just kidding. I think hopefully you'll all, you'll all find that this resonates with you on different extents. And I, I apologize ahead of time. When I've done this kind of message before, you, you always want to identify with your audience because you realize you're a part of your audience. And rarely have I ever given a sermon where in categorical ways, I don't fit it in the topic I'm talking about. So if I accidentally slip into a mode and say something like, you know, as women, we need to, and I was like, whoa, hey, wait, I got to think about that. Uh, so I, you kind of accidentally slip into some of these modes, and I'll do my best not to do that. All right, number one, the first, uh, first facet of a woman's design I want to focus on. We're already in Genesis. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'm already on that page. Genesis chapter 2. And... Let's read about the creation of woman. We read the details of that in Genesis 2, starting in verse 18. Now, we'll just grab this one verse in this passage. Genesis 2, 18. It says, The eternal God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. That is, woman was made a helper comparable to her husband, in this case, Adam. The phrase there in terms of a helper comparable has often uh, been translated in different ways. In the old King James, I think it's help meet, not M-E-A-T. Uh, some men do treat women like meat. They want to help themselves too, uh, but M-E-E-T. But the word there, it, it means meat as in fitting, as in comparable for, like pieces of a puzzle so are comparable to each other. They're clearly designed to go together. And so it's a help that's comparable to him in a way that giraffes and hyenas and blue whales and the rest are not comparable to him. This is someone designed so that the two of them make a complete pair uh, and belong in that way. Uh, the Hebrew phrase, and I, I'm sure that I won't say it well, but I've seen it pronounced different ways, but I'm just going to say Ezer 
Conegdo. Ezer Conegdo. You can spell Ezer E Z E R. And Conegdo, which sounds like a martial art of some sort, K E N E G D O. K E N E G D O. Those are common sort of anglicized spellings. Ezer Conegdo. Conegdo communicates that alongsidedness, if you will, that complementary nature. Uh, the design, not just designed to help, but truly to be a help for man. Uh, really specialized, personalized in that kind of way. A connecto, alongside man. And then Ezer, or it could be Ezer, but I'm from Texas, I like to say Ezer. Uh, that word is the help part. It, it carries the burden of that. Uh, a woman is designed to be an ezer, uh, a help. So here when woman is designed, we see this first statement made, that she's a helper comparable uh, to the man. That is a fascinating word, ezer. If you actually do sort of a, an Englishman's concordance search and you look for how else it's used, it's a word that you will find is incredibly frequently a word that God chooses to apply to himself. We sing about it in our hymns, right? In fact, I'll give you a reference. So we'll just go ahead and turn to this one, Psalm 33 and verse 20. We'll just look at one example. Some of you are probably already thinking of the psalm. It's one of the great things about our hymns. With hymns rooted in the Bible, you tend to get Bible stuff shoved in your brain whether you want it there or not, and uh, whether you like it or not. And it's a, it's a great gift of music. Psalm 33 We'll see one of these instances. Psalm 33, and it's right there in verse 20. Israel speaks, our soul waits for the eternal, verse 20. He is our help and our shield. How common is it to hear God refer to himself in that way? In fact, if you're looking for this word, that's actually most of the applications you would find. And yet when it comes to the creation of woman, he designates her with that, that she is the help. There are so many verses. I, I don't want you to write all of these down. I'm just going to list a few just to make sure you're, you're more for the fact to make sure you're aware. We just read Psalm 33 and verse 20. Uh, you'd see the word used for God in Psalm 70 and verse 5. In Deuteronomy 33, and verse 26, and verse 27. Psalm 115, verses 10 through 11. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 124, verse 8. Uh, Psalm 146, and verse 5. The point is, God seems to enjoy taking that word and applying it to himself. And yet, in the creation of woman, she is designed as the help. Now, the world desperately wants to convince women that it is demeaning to be considered as part of your purpose, a helper. And yet God has chosen to apply this to woman as a part of her design. That's what they seek to reject. In fact, actually, it's not just scientists and the, the, say the, the neutral world out there. A lot of liberal theologians are doing the same thing. I've seen arguments trying to take this word, uh, the Ezer Conegdo, and use it to say that there's a superiority to women. Because look, it's applied to God so frequently. Uh, you know, she's not really a help. She's like a savior. I mean, she's the one who comes in. You know, that he should really look up to her as a superior of some sort. Because isn't God, you know, our superior? I've seen that in liberal theological circles. Uh, it's garbage. It's complete garbage. It's, it's the Bible being twisted by people to try to serve a worldly end. Uh, as, as one fellow noticed in it, he said, you know, he said, that doesn't make any sense. In every sense, the word is, 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 even when it's applied to God, the focus is on always, I'm the helper because the focus is on what you need and how I can help. It's really God serving Israel in various places. Women by design are helpers. Just like God is our help. You know, the idea that a woman should be mindful of a future helping a husband and helping rear children in a family, that somehow that should have some kind of priority in her planning for education purposes or job skills is anathema in the world today. 
anathema. It's interesting. I'll, I'll use a little pop culture. Uh, in the second Avengers movie of the, the Marvel movies, the 10 years worth of movies, uh, the creator of the second one, the director, writer, etc., Joss Whedon, was known as a huge pro-feminist guy. I mean, really, he, he created the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series. These are not endorsements. I hope you understand. I'm just talking about things in the world. He created the series. He was known for powerful female characters, for really holding up women. He was a hero of feminism. And he made one mistake in their eyes in that movie, uh, and suddenly he was castigated. Uh, it actually ran him off Twitter. Everybody said, oh, no, we broke Joss Whedon, they all said is he had, there's a female character, uh, the Black Widow character, Natasha Romanoff, and she's, she's lived her life as an assassin. You know, the movies like women that are great at fighting and all the rest. It's fictional, but they like doing that. And she is explaining to another character that she feels like a monster. Spoiler alert, the movie's been out for years, but she says she feels like a monster because part of the initiation to make you a good, effective killer is that when you kind of graduated, they sterilized you so you couldn't have children. And she explains it sort of tearfully that that's what she sacrificed to do this. And she says that like it's something negative. And the feminist came out of the woodwork. Say, how dare you? How dare you say that somehow a woman who feels that's a bad thing in any kind of way, uh, not the fact that it is the case, that can be the case, but just the fact that a woman should even care about that, that somehow children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or somehow could in any way be important. And so they ran, uh, ran Joss Whedon off of social media, uh, one of their heroes. Uh, they don't want women to feel like their purpose in any way is to be a helper. And yet God himself said that's part of what he designed. It's part of what he designed. It actually doesn't pass, this idea that that's not part of woman's design, it doesn't even pass the smell test of Hollywood. Uh, how often when Hollywood creates a scene where there's a corporation of some sort, uh, you know, some sort of business, whether it's good or evil or whatever, when the other characters walk into the, the room to see the CEO or whatever, now maybe the CEO is a woman, maybe it's a man, these days, you know, a lot of times, unless it's a bad guy, probably a man, if it's a good guy, could be a woman, but more often than not, at least in my experience, Who's behind the receptionist desk? It's often a woman. Not always, but often. Who's often the administrative assistant in some kind of way? It's often a woman. Why is that? I don't think it's just because that's their experience. I think it's just natural to do that because I have to be honest, they're often better at it. They're often far better at it. The idea of being a help to the people who come in, actually caring about their problems so they can actually try to, you know, try to help and make it better and do something. Um, you know, Hollywood, actually, I'm waiting for them to make that, make that big switch. It tends to reflect her design as a comparable helper, someone who wants to fit in in a way that is truly helpful to another person. It's often just husbands. It's why it can be so terribly damaging to tell our wives, I don't need you. And I've known men who have said that to their wives. I don't need you. I can stand on my own. Not only does it actually violate scripture where it says it's not good, the man should be alone. In that idea, it's like, nah, I've, I've seen you, dude. You probably do. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in your house. I think you need her. Uh, I think there's something missing here, you know, that you really do, you really do need. But for a woman, it strikes at the core. If I'm not a help, then what am I? Don't get me wrong. There are things there. I'm not saying there's not, but still... It's a terrible thing to say, really to anyone, but in particular when it comes to design to a woman, to say, I don't need you. Often it's spoken out of pride and arrogance anyway, but it's just a terrible thing to say uh, to a woman and to a wife. Women by design are helpers. Second point, second thing. Women by design tend to be more compassionate and nurturing. Women by design tend to be more compassionate and nurturing and reflect their creator in a way in that category that frequently, generally, men aren't as good at. 
And I hope I understand when I say, you know, that we're not as good at that. Sometimes it's because that's a feature as well. Sometimes you need the person who doesn't care. Uh, you need the man to come in and say, look, I don't care. This is what we're doing, you know, and that's just it. Uh, you know, the person who doesn't have to carry the bug outside, uh, you know, so that it's safe someplace else. And I'll fess up to having done that. Um, but it's actually, it's a little fun dropping the bug into the toilet and wondering what kind of trials he's going through, you know, as he, uh, you know. Uh, sometimes it helps to be the cold, heartless creature uh, who has to find the beautiful animal in the forest, a majestic evidence of God's creation, and kill it and rip its skin off and all the rest to feed a family. However, there is something, this compassion and nurturing. There is something to that, that in general, again, generalizing, women are designed to reflect concerning their creator in a way that men aren't. And God recognizes that and even uses that in Scripture. Many of us, I, I hope many of us, are familiar. If you're not, it's, uh, you can read it in Matthew and uh, another gospel. But Christ talks about how, look at fathers. If a son asks you for bread or for a fish to eat, he said, even human fathers wouldn't say, oh, yeah, here's a rock. I'm not going to give you bread. Here's a rock. Or I'm not going to give you a fish to eat. Here's a snake. It's unclean and everything, and it's poisonous, but I don't care. Eat that. Christ says, a worldly father would never provide in that kind of way. Now, there's some fathers that get broke in their heads and things and perhaps do. But he says, look, even worldly fathers who aren't perfect generally would never do that, let alone me. He goes, I never will. I never will. And we're familiar with that. But let's also turn to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Whoops. Sorry, that was for me. It's going the wrong direction. Isaiah 49. And here we see the word, the one who would, who would become Jesus Christ, the, uh, the God of Israel, trying to encourage us, encourage Israel, encourage his people who sometimes feel forgotten. And I don't know about you, maybe sometimes you feel forgotten. It's easy to do. The world is difficult. It beats us up a lot. And sometimes it's easy to think that perhaps, perhaps, even if it's for a moment, God has forgotten so what picture does he use to say, I never will? I never, never will. We start in Isaiah 49 and verse 14. We read where he says, can a woman forget? Sorry, 14. But Zion said, the eternal has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. And he answers, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. He says, look, it is, we hear horror stories in the news in times of, of mothers killing their children. Not to mention abortion, which is one of the most upside down facts of our world that is conceivable. But still, women that have just gone off of some terror into some terrible place and have actively murdered their children. There's famous cases. I, I don't want to bring them up. The meat killers don't, don't need publicity. But it strikes us as odd because it's the very opposite of what we would expect. You know, we do talk about fathers and children. And if you think about how often you refer to those things, it's not always. Again, we're not talking about universals. We're talking about trends and generalizations. We often think of fathers and children and think of an instructional role. When you talk about fathers and sons, if I just said the word fathers and sons, and I said well, the sermon today is going to be about fathers and sons, it'd be understandable if you thought about, yeah, we're talking about you know, teaching and leading and, and protecting and, and guiding. But when you talk about mother and child, what leaps to mind? Thoughts of compassion, thoughts of nurturing, because that's natural. God himself appeals to that. He says, you don't think I have compassion on you? He says, look, he said, the women of the world who are mothers, how many of them would ever forget the child who nursed at their breast? And yet, even as some of them may possibly do so, I never will. In the way that a woman is designed to be better at compassion and at nurturing, she reflects her creator. 
Even Jesus actually used one. We won't turn there for the sake of time, but you're probably familiar with the passage where he's looking out over Jerusalem. And what does he say? He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Uh, that was Matthew chapter 22, maybe? 23 and 37. If I find if I give the rest of reference before I read one and say, let's not turn to it over the sake of time, people still turn to it. So I like to give it afterwards. Uh, but what does he say? What he could have said is, Jerusalem, how I long to fight for you like an angry rooster, you know, and go after the wolf. And, and, and he could have done that. And there's times when he expresses that kind of sentiment. But here, what does he choose? He chooses the hen seeking to protect her young. This kind of self-sacrificial compassion uh, for, for the weak uh, and for the lowly. Again, I'm not trying to diminish the vital role of fathers. I, 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 I wouldn't say I took issue. Generally, I like to think I'm easy to offend. I'm mean, sorry, did I say easy to offend? What a terrible thing to say. Freudian slip. Uh, I like to think, I've been told by my wife, hopefully not in fear, that I, I'm hard to offend. But I will admit something. It doesn't offend me because people don't mean it poorly. But when the kids were little and they'd find, like I would sometimes stay with them and give my wife some freedom, poor woman, uh, four boys, and actually go do something and try to maintain her sanity. And uh, someone would say, oh, so you're babysitting the kids, right? I'd say, I am not babysitting. Nothing against being a babysitter. Very noble profession. However, I'm a father. This is an obligation I have, right? I'm not a hireling. Uh, this is, these are my children. I'm a father. I'm not trying to diminish the role of uh, fathers in that way. But I am saying, if I'm honest, there is a lot more nurturing and compassion for the kids from her side than mine sometimes. Uh, when the kids' diapers are messy, you know, whenever it's like, oh, mom, when it, she's making food for them, oh, I don't like that. Well, that's why I made this for you. It's like, oh, honey, just make them eat whatever. I don't get, they, should, they, should, they shouldn't have choices. Why are you giving them choices, right? Uh, you know, she's the one who will make a separate vegetable because that's the one so-and-so likes. And I uh, just be upfront. She's better than I am in that regard, and she reflects her creator in that way better than I do. It's not a knock on me. You might think it is. I don't think it is. It's because that's part of her design, and I appreciate it, uh, and that's uh, what God does. It's interesting. The world does not like this, this idea. Um, I, I found some articles uh, back in 2018, just 2018. The Atlantic had written an article February 18th, 2018, the title was, The More Gender Equality, The Fewer Women in STEM, that is science, tech, engineering, mathematics, careers. Uh, it's been called the gender paradox, or the gender equality paradox. And what they found was that, uh, well, I'll actually read the summary. It says, a new study explores a strange paradox. In countries that empower women, they are less likely to choose math and science professions. Now, when you read it more broadly, the details are actually far more fascinating even than that. What they did was they took countries where, where the social support system is super high so that if, say, you're a divorced woman or a single woman, man, you, you are really taken care of. You still have all the choices in the world. And they don't count America as really one of those. A lot of Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, where, where women are pressed in every way to, to choose what you want, and they're given more, they're considered in these, by these studies, by these, if I would say, politically liberal standards. These are the countries that are the ideal. These are the countries America should be striving for because women are super free to choose. They don't have to worry about support. They don't have to worry about financial need. It's all taken care of, and they can just choose what they want to do. And what they find is that even in those cases, the majority of engineering, design jobs, et cetera, are applied for by men, and the majority of nursing, caregiving jobs are still applied for by women. Now, you would think it's a celebration. Women are just free to do what they want, and it's considered a problem. In fact, I have a quote from one of the scientists. He says, if we can understand, so speaking of these women, if we can understand their motivations, then interventions can be designed to help them change their minds. And that's actually not from the Atlantic. That's uh, the, Irish, the uh, Irish newspaper, The Journal, actually on the same day had a similar report. 
He's like, it's not, it's not enough to make women free enough to choose what they want to do. We have to actively design interventions to change their minds so that what women want to do is what we want them to do. It's literally a parody of gender equality. It's like, oh no, women are doing what they want. We've got to, is it, can we do something surgically? Uh, can we brainwash them so they want what we male scientists want them to do? The guy wasn't male, actually, who made that, came, that statement. It's insane. The world doesn't want you to do that. It doesn't want you to freely choose to be a woman. To accept, I like nurturing. I like being compassionate. I want to be a Florence Nightingale. I want to serve others. I want to be there when the kids are throwing up and all the rest. I shouldn't say that. I was in charge of that with our kids. But anyway, because it was gross, right? So, you know, so that was me. Uh, but we don't want women choosing these things. It puts the lie to the idea that we want women to be free. It's what we want women to defy God's design and match what we want them to be. Please never fall into the idea that Satan is not behind all of this. He is making this more and more his world as best he can. The world sees it as a paradox that women actually tend to be more compassionate and more nurturing, but it's not. It's God's design showing itself. All right, a third thing, a third element of the design of woman is that women generally are designed to care more about intimacy and relationships. Women generally, see I'm emphasizing that, uh, designed to care more about intimacy and relationships. It's a stereotype they use in sitcoms and comedians will talk about it. And increasingly they don't talk about those things because comedians are getting in trouble for talking about differences in genders and things like that. But that doesn't mean it's, rooted, it's not rooted in fact, it is. It's rooted in design. And again, it reflects our creator. I actually, I can't remember who gave this advice. I wish I could. It was, a, it was some sort of marriage seminar. I don't think it was in the church. It was some educational material that was recommended. And the advice was given that for men, if you want to know if your relationship is in difficulty, you really do need to listen to whether or not your wife thinks it's in difficulty. That doesn't mean she's right. And doesn't mean she's right about why there's a difficulty. But he was advising men, she's just better at picking up on some things. It's just part of what she does. Now, in a lot of these things, especially we'll see them with the last one or two, they can be twisted by the forces of the world. And they can be twisted by uh, evil temptations. The fact that women are more designed in general to care about intimacy and relationships also tends to lead towards a desire for gossip. Because... What is most interesting is some of the relationships and such that are seen and leads people to, to talk about them, sometimes inappropriately. Again, that is not a uniquely female phenomenon. If you're a dude and you think you can't gossip, you just haven't paid attention to yourself very much. You certainly can. Um, however, this focus on relationships often can lead to that, but it does reflect our creator. Uh, if we turn to John chapter 17. Now, some of you may know exactly where I'm going. If you do, think to yourself, I think he's going to this verse. Before you get there, and later on, let me know, and I will, well, I'll just say good job. I'm not going to do much more than that. But anyway, uh, you might realize where I'm going because it's such a natural fit. In John chapter 17. The difficulty with summarizing things is the details that are left out are often the important nuances that it takes to fully understand something. So keep that in mind whenever a Protestant or someone wants to use a Bible verse to manipulate you into dropping things that are important. Uh, and so danger could be done with this verse, but not really in the context that I hope most of us attending here today in the Church of God are able to bring to it. If you had to boil eternal life down to a statement or a goal, be hard to do, but Jesus Christ did so. This is his last precious moments of, of teaching with his disciples before he was crucified, and he gave them a very important kind of summary. In John 17 and verse 3, he said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, 
whom you have sent. And I want to be honest with all of we're fam- we're family, right? We are, uh, you know, at least in the spirit. I have not always thought of my uh, of the faith and of our religion. If I go back, especially when I was in college, that's what I'm thinking of. Shortly after I was baptized, I tend to think of the faith and our religion as far more uh, contractual, contractual, like having a contract. Uh, where well, this is what it is. I do what I'm responsible for, then God's going to do what He's responsible for, and that's it, right? That's 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 really all there is. Um, and I remember we had some uh, evangelical college students going around the dorms and where I went to college and, and asking people, oh, do you know you're going to go to heaven? Do you know you're going to go to heaven? Well, I wasn't there. I it was probably a church actually out of town in Waco. And when they came by my dorm, so thankfully I wasn't there. But regrettably, when I got back, my roommate, Jeff, is his real name, Jeff said, uh, hey, Wally, you missed these guys, but don't worry. We told them to come back for you. Because uh, I think he was looking forward to, to that. So anyway, they came and they said, well, h- how do you know that you're going to live in heaven forever? I said, well, let me stop you right there, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I believe actually that the kingdom of God is going to reign on earth, over the earth, uh, during a millennium, you know, be a thousand years, and uh, uh, that I want to be a part of that. And then it's going to expand into the universe. Kind of best I did uh, 90 seconds of God's whole plan, and they kind of had this look, you know, it's like, well, okay, I think that counts. Does that count, Bill? Yeah, I think that counts, Bob. So anyway, regardless, you know, but they said, but really, how do you know? How do you know you're going to be a part of that? And I gave just one of the worst answers. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of bad answers you could give. But mine, it just, honestly, I think it accidentally communicated probably some of the, the worst stereotypes of how people mischaracterize us. And I said, well, I know God has a law, and I seek to obey that law. And if I'm seeking to obey that law, then he's obligated to, you know, include me in his family. Yeah, thanks for the comment. So, yeah, I apologize, you know, for my poor witness, because all I'm thinking of is the distinctives. I know what they're thinking, which is essentially a cheap grace, even when they don't understand that's what it is. And I'm trying to to pack in the fact that, no, there's an obligation. You've got to live God's way of life. And as a result, I just, I just didn't do it well. And is that really it? Are we going to be in the kingdom of God just because we had a list at home that you could fit on a post-it note and every morning we checked them off? Even then, part of the benefit of seeking to keep God's law is the relationship you develop with the one who created that law. When he boils it down, he says... This is eternal life, that they may know you. In fact, if you seek to know him without pursuing obedience, without seeking to to match his mind and the way he thinks about things, then you just have to keep his law. You won't be able to, you won't be able to develop that relationship unless you're actually seeking to do that. All right, we'll move along to the, I want to say last couple of things, but then you'll know there's five. And if I don't make it to the fifth, you'll call me on it. So let's just say the next one. All right, so the next one. Women generally are designed to want to be beautiful. Now, this is the one I've wondered the most sometimes, if suddenly the rocks are going to come out and the tomatoes and such, because I, I do want to mention up front the world has perverted what it means to be beautiful. Uh, the world has uh, made it shallow. Frankly, more than just shallow, made it something it's not. Uh, how many women, even unconsciously today, because it's such an, an ingrained part of our culture, make their choices about how they look and what they choose to wear, etc., because it's sexy? What in the world does that even mean? Think of the word. What does it mean? For someone to say, oh, you know, I really want to look sexy today. It just feels weird for me to say it. I'm a man. So anyway, but what does that even mean? Right? I mean, think about it. Is that really the goal? I, I want to purposefully arouse sexual feelings in all the people who look at me. When you say it that way, that doesn't actually sound right at all, right? That's, a, that's not right. But what else does sexy mean? 
please don't make me expand on it anymore. I'm going to get really uncomfortable. And yet, we, we, we think of that as a compliment, right, today, generally. But be careful of that. Generally, what it means in more reality is, is available. Is you're seeking to dress in a manner that looks available for sexuality. Uh, the world is making a lot of money convincing women that to be beautiful, they need to dress like prostitutes. And it is a blot on our culture. And I am sorry, ladies, because I know it is getting harder and harder to find clothes to wear that, don't, that aren't geared in that direction. I know it is. And I don't even do the shopping, right? I'm not even buying ladies' clothes. The boys won't let me. They want to they wear guy clothes. Um, there's a fact of life that marketers and salesmen have figured out. And that's that in general, women want to see men in three-piece suits and men want to see women in their birthday suits. And a lot of money flows from that realization. And that is all we are to the marketers and the salesmen is giant walking wallets. And so the world has perverted what it means to be beautiful. You know, how many selfies out there are taken because someone feels particularly beautiful and they make the duck lips. There's just ladies, I've said it before, there's nothing beautiful about duck lips. Don't do that. But still, you know, the, you know so it's the selfie because they want to be, and I've, I've seen it. And, and sure enough, I'll admit, you know, they're beautiful, beautiful women. And all the, the comments start coming in. Oh, girl, you're so beautiful. Oh, and there's the emoji with the hard eyes. And it's a flood of comments about how beautiful you are. But are we training women that that's what they're supposed to be doing? Go out there and make sure you get all of this. It's essentially taking advantage. It's the devil taking advantage of part of woman's design because it is very natural for a woman to want to be beautiful. And the devil has turned that against our culture. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter 3. And verse 3, starting there. First Peter, First Peter 3 and verse 3. Peter says to ladies, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be of the hidden person, uh, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is a very precious, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner. In former times, the holy women who trusted God also trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now, at the same time, we go back, and Sarah did radiate a beauty. I mean, there was a beauty that Pharaoh, who did not know her, was able to perceive, just in the way she carried herself, in the way she took care of herself. Her looks are not otherwise described to us there. A woman desires to be beautiful, and it is amazing where you can see a woman at work or something, and she's dressed really well, uh, she, you know, uh, expensive earrings. She looks like she goes to the gym, you know, uh, every day but five minutes, you know, every five days of the week. And then you talk to her and get to know her and find out this is not a beautiful woman. This is someone I don't want to spend time with, nor would I want my boys to ever marry anyone like this ever in 15,000 lifetimes. And there's women who don't match the photoshopped images you see on magazines, right? Uh, that as a man gets to know them, he realizes, I'm not sure I've ever been in the presence of someone as attractive as this. Now, it's not going to be if she's got, you know, a breath that smells like she eats gym socks every morning and all the rest. There, there is a balance. That's what I'm trying to talk about. You do generally see, for instance, women take more care with their hair. For us guys, a lot of times it's like pruning a dead bush anyway, so there's really not much going on. But generally, not always. I have seen some guys that spend a fantastic amount of time on their hair, and some of you, you know, you're that guy. But in general, in general, why? Because a woman wants to be beautiful. That is not inherently wrong, depending on what we're doing with that. And again, she reflects her creator in that way. 
Uh, we'll just look at one verse, though. There are others we could for the point. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 27. I mean, how many women, even now you get into the teenage high school years, are going to doctors and having them butcher their bodies with knives and scalpels and placing in them things of various unnatural chemicals to try to achieve some perverted idea of what's necessary to be beautiful. And so I'm not trying to encourage that at all. But the world does know that that's a desire. In fact, that one song, man, I just wish it would go away. Uh, one Direction, is that what, that's what makes you beautiful? Uh, think about that. I like the way Mr. Weston puts these things. Who came up with that song? Right? Who realized that, you know what? That's my evil CEO voice. You know, you got to imagine a cigar. You know what? You know what girls are afraid of? They don't think they're beautiful. They're insecure. <laughs> I don't know what accent this is. But they're insecure. And what they want is to know that even though they're insecure, everybody else thinks they're beautiful and that their insecurity is unfounded. Boys who make a song like that were billionaires, right? That's exactly what they did. And boy, it comes on, oh, it's all dance, right? Because it is satisfying a desire that you're insecure about feeling beautiful, and the song is designed to think, don't worry, baby, you are. Don't worry, you are. And they're raking in the money. But the thing is, what it is, they've discovered a true thing that a woman wants to be beautiful. And again, they reflect their creator, who is beautiful. Uh, I'll just pick one, and words can be translated differently, but in the end, you do see that this is a valid statement. Psalm 27 and verse 4. Read David say, One thing I have desired of the eternal, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the eternal all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the eternal and to inquire in his temple. Now, you notice if you have a New King James Bible, the footnote might say that could be delightfulness. But part of the reason we don't see those things as being the same thing anymore is because how shallow our concept is of beauty these days. They chose beauty because that is an excellent translation. But often a person who was not delightful, you would never actually refer to as beautiful. And there's other, you could write down Psalm 90, verse 17. There's another example. But let me actually consider something else. When God describes himself, inspires a description of himself in Revelation chapter 4, it talks about the throne. And what it doesn't say is he who sat there was like a bum in dirty clothes who didn't care about his appearance. What it says is he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. There's going to be something amazing about God. Just when we see him, you're going to see and recognize this is something special. Think about this, the world around you, Hawaii. Some of you have been blessed to be able to go to, to Hawaii for the feast. God didn't have to make Hawaii beautiful. Think of sunsets. God didn't have to make the sunset beautiful. He could have made it, again, mentioned Minecraft. He could have made it a little sun that just goes do-do-do-do-do-do-do, and that's it, and it's gone, right? Like a video game, it just fulfilled a function. God could have made a functional world, and instead he chose to make a beautiful world. It does matter to God. Uh, one more statement about this before we go to the last thing. There's a, a, a I think it's the Eldridges, the John and Stacy Eldridge, talk about a time when they went to a, an art festival, or a fair or something, to look at a bunch of art. And there in the art, uh, over the, it's like over a couple of days or something, it took a while to see it all. And at the end, they were talking about it. And they said, well, did you notice how many, it was, it was modern art, so it wasn't all the classic stuff, but still, how many of the, the paintings featuring uh, people they were supposed to be beautiful, that there were women. And women in these kind of reclined poses, you know, sort of, you know, or, or you know, reading a book of poetry on a, you know, on a trellis, is a trellis, a th you know what I'm saying? But anyway, all these kinds of things, often without clothes. Why can't artists put clothes on people? I don't, well, I guess I do understand why they don't, but still, you know, people wear clothes normally. But still, they talk about all these things and these beautiful pictures of women, and they noted how few pictures there were of nude men reclining, you know, so it just seems ridiculous to say it, right? Of, you know, just kind of standing, you know, on the veranda, 
with a book of poetry. They said, why don't we see that? And he said, it's natural to know why you don't see that. Because you see a naked man reclining on a couch. You're like, get up and mow the lawn. What are you doing? What are you doing? Because men are designed for utility. You know, we're designed to accomplish something. What we're not designed for, I'm sorry, guys, is to be beautiful. But women are. And we are blessed um, with beauty amongst us, I know, in our congregation. And guys, we're not the ones contributing to that. So, so you know, except, you know, some of you guys, you're real, real pretty. All right, the last, the last comment. And this one, again, can be abused and can be misunderstood. And all these things have to be understood in a perspective. Generally, by design, women want to be seen as worth seeking after. A woman wants to be seen as worth seeking after. Uh, Edgar said in his book, Love and Respect, I think, phrase it this way, a woman longs to be first in importance. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, they're trying to find the Ark of the Covenant. That's the MacGuffin of the movie. She wants to be that something that's worth seeking after, uh, that's worth, you know, working through the Nazis, you know, and the, uh, and the tombs and all the rest, because she wants to feel and to know and to be shown that she's worth the effort, that she's worth the effort to win. And it's a part of that design, and it has been abused, and men have used that to make terrible choices. That's why, in the, especially in the Me Too movement era, you've got to be careful about that because men will justify, ah, oh, I know she says that she doesn't like that and she's married and she's going to sue me and uh, she thinks I'm the most disgusting man she's ever met, but I can tell she's just playing hard to get. Uh, that's not the case. You're a jerk uh, is what that is. You know, the old tradition of the, 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 the boss who's constantly chasing his secretary around the desk uh, when really there's times I want to tell her what to do. You just drop down in a ball, and he falls right over you, uh, breaks a tooth, and you go find another job. That's what I would recommend. I saw one of the boys do that to his brother once. It was really effective. Um, it's a terrible thing to see this abused, but it doesn't change the fact that there is something in a woman's design where generally, and generally, she wants to be seen as something sought after, Again, she reflects her creator in this. Turn to Jeremiah 29. In fact, God is not the caricature that the world often makes him out to be. I heard it put this way once. It was a point made that, uh, uh, what was it? That, you know, there, there's some people you know in your life who are so desperate to be liked, they'll just do anything. Uh, they're just kind of pleading. They don't really need you to seek them because they're so desperate for your acceptance. It's the kid you didn't respect in high school. Maybe you've even been that kid and you've grown up and realized there's more important things in life than having the cool kids like me. And the world pictures God that way, where he's so desperate to get people into church that, boy, if you want skateboarding, we got a skateboarding club. You know, if you want to sing songs that uh, we got a, a drum set and we've got uh, tambourines, and we've got a saxophone and eight guitars and four lead singers. And it just goes on and on. If you want that, man, come to church. You won't even know you're at church. It'll be a concert. You won't even know. You won't even know. It's like God is that desperate that he's going to do whatever it takes just to get you to like him. And that is not the God that's pictured in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah 29 We're told the opposite. We start in verse 11 to make sure we have context. This is not out of lack of love for Israel. God loves his people. It's not a lack of love. It's not a callousness. It's not a hardness. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the eternal thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope that you, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and Find me when you search for me with all your heart. God wants to be sought after like there's nothing else worth seeking after more. 
And it's not because of his neediness, if you will, or a need for validation. It transforms us to seek him in that way. It's part of the process of making us everything he wants us to be. But that said, that is what he expects. What does he say to Israel while they're in captivity? We read, I don't have time to turn there, Deuteronomy says, from there, when you're in captivity, you will seek the eternal, your God, and you will find him if, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And as a part of woman's design, generally, again, generally, she wants to be worth seeking. That's part of what happens in marriage is sometimes as guys, we think we married them. Oh, good, we got them. I can't believe she fell for that, right? And so next, you know, she's stuck for the next 50, 60, 100 years, and the pursuit stops. And it doesn't happen anymore. As if I don't have to seek anymore, when still she wants to know that she's worth seeking. It's, uh, it's interesting, and, and it, it, all this hope is in balance. I'm not trying to say, so, you know, hey, ladies, go beat up on your husband tonight because I just validated all your arguments with him. Uh, like I did in the last time, say, hey, hun, husband, go beat up on your wife, you know, verbally because I just tried to validate all your arguments. It's a matter of balance and perspective. But for instance, when you talk to a husband and wife and the wife says, I just feel like he, he, he's not investing in me. He doesn't care about me anymore. He doesn't spend any time with me. And the husband's saying, Look, I don't understand. The whole reason I go to work and work extra hours is to put food on the table. The only work, reason I go to work and spend this much time at work is because I'm trying to build the life that we want. And then you ask the wife again, she says, I know, but it just seems like he's married to the job and not to me. Now, I'm not saying in that hypothetical arrangement that she's necessarily right or he's necessarily wrong. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But it's very easy as men to dismiss that that somehow she needs to gain a different perspective because I'm achieving and conquering all of this for us. When really, it's no good achieving and conquering for a wife who one day isn't there anymore. And maybe we don't need two of the best cars in the world. We just need one and a half that work pretty well uh, because she wants to be pursued as much as we're pursuing that database project for our company, and it's a part of her design. And we can't ask them to not be designed the way God designed them. You know, I'll close with this observation. If you were to go to Genesis and read the creation of, of man and woman, you would see that he keeps describing the creation as good. You know, he makes this, oh, it's good, oh, that's good, oh, it's good, and he said it was good. Good, 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 good. You know, there's only one time in the entirety of the story of creation where he says, ooh, this is bad. And we already read it. It was Genesis 2 and verse 18, where he made everything but woman. He made man. Adam was done. He had not yet committed sin. He was in communion with God. And yet God still said, it is not good that man should be alone. It's the only moment when creation is described as not good. And yet what is the only missing ingredient from creation at that point. It's woman. Creation wasn't sufficient without her. And yet the moment he brought her into the game, then the descriptions go from good to being very good. The world is better with woman. And she communicates things about God that just as men, we don't. Just like we communicate things about God in our design, that she doesn't. And in that way, you could think of it this way. It's not really one of the points, but she kind of pictures her creator in that way as well. God has made a fascinating world and a fascinating universe. And who amongst us would actually truly say on the whole that it's good? In fact, it's not good because it is missing that last ingredient. And that last ingredient will come with the sound of a trumpet and its creator will return. And for the first time in a good 6,000 years, the creation will have the opportunity to actually upgrade from good to very good. Let's not allow the world to take certain things from us. 
Don't allow the world to take God's teachings about your design, the things that God wants you in your life to communicate through that design. Celebrate it, embrace it, and let your creator show himself through you by embracing how you have been designed.